Two years ago, I reached peak delusion when I became convinced that Sam Ryder would be the beginning of a golden age for the UK at Eurovision. Unfortunately, since then, things have been not so great. Sure, it's a lot better than the 2010s. We'll go into that in depth, by the way. But things have not quite gone to plan. With our withdrawal from Junior Eurovision confirmed this week, it feels like a good time to reflect on what's going well and what isn't. That requires an understanding of where we've come from, but before I go through some of the awful musical crimes that we committed in the 2010s, don't forget to like and subscribe uh, to this video. That doesn't make sense. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. You can follow me and my editor Jay on Twitter. You can follow me on Instagram as well. We have a Discord now. Link is in the description. You can come chat with us in there too. And finally, you can buy a channel membership or support us on Patreon to get videos early and support us financially. Now, over the last 15 years, the UK has been chopping and changing the way it selects our Eurovision entry. We have done all sorts of terrible things. So let's go through them, starting with 20. 10. That means our whistle stop tour begins with That Sounds Good To Me by Josh Dubavy. You bring the sunshine, I'll bring the good times. Dubovy, Dubovy, Dubovy. That Sounds Good To Me has to be one of the most ironically named Eurovision songs of all time. It sounds like a Rick Astley 80s B-side and the fact that it was written by Pete Waterman and Mike Stock, who were only relevant in the 80s and 90s, contributes to that as well. This song was received by the artists competing in the national selection that year, so late in the day that one of the people that Josh was competing against forgot the words of the song while she was performing it. It was obvious already at this point that this song was going to do terribly, but then they decided to make things even worse by revamping it into a key that Josh couldn't see. Sing in. As a result, the conclusion of this song at Eurovision came with this attempt at a big note. To, me. to be fair to Josh, he stated since that he had no creative control whatsoever and that this key change, along with every other creative decision, was simply imposed on him. He was a young artist, he had no previous musical history, and I genuinely feel for him being in that situation and not being able to do anything about the car crash that was inevitably approaching. At the same time, you should try not to look too much into him now because he's adopted some interesting views. Let's just say he's swapped the microphone for the tinfoil hat and move on. On to 2011 and we lurched wildly from one end of the spectrum to the other, from someone with no musical experience to a band that had masses. In 2011, we sent Blue with their song, I Can. Blue were still not that relevant, but compared to Pete Waterman, they were the most modern thing you could possibly imagine. The crazy thing about this entry is that it was actually quite good. I remember as a kid being seriously excited when I first heard this, and given how weak 2011 was as a whole, I thought we had a pretty good chance. Unfortunately for us, Blue forgot that the Friday night rehearsal was the one the juries voted on. As a result, they phoned it in and did terribly. To quote Wee Wee Blog's review of their stage show, there were as many pitch problems as there were gays in the audience and that's a lot. In fairness to them, they did still come fifth with the public, but their disastrous performance with the juries meant that they finished outside of the top 10 overall. Given the amount of hype surrounding their participation that year, this was a big disappointment. Little did I know then, that would be the high point for Eurovision in the UK for the next 11 years. Things went seriously downhill from there, starting with our bright idea to reanimate the damp corpses of Engelbert Humperdinck and Bonnie Tyler. They managed a grand total of 35 points between them, and to be honest, I have absolutely no idea what the BBC was trying to achieve with these participations. It was so obviously doomed to failure, and both of these songs were dated, dull, grey, totally uninteresting, and had zero chance of any success in Eurovision. In addition, with all respect to these two artists who had great careers, they were simply well past their best, especially Bonnie Tyler, by the time they performed at the show. After this, we move out of our internally select a washed up act who is trying to revive their career era into a internally select a random person that no one has ever heard of era, and to be fair, it looked briefly like it might start working. That started in 2014 with Children of the Universe by Molly. It's time for me to reveal myself as a Children of the Universe defender because you cannot tell me that the studio version of this song 
isn't great. It didn't really work live, and more on that in a minute, but it was so refreshing when this was first revealed to the public. Given how aged and creaking we had felt since 2010, it seemed like the BBC had taken on the criticism and was trying to do something different. This was way more modern and way more adventurous, relatively speaking, than anything we'd had for years before it, and it was the right thing to do at the time. What's more, unlike every other entry we've discussed so far, Molly actually wrote this song herself. Unfortunately, that is where the positives end. ESC Insight made an entire video roasting this staging because it was so bad. Sadly, it's not available on YouTube anymore because the EBU have copyright striked it, but I will leave a link in the description to the relevant parts. In addition, to that, Molly's vocal on the night of the show didn't come off either. I remember sitting and watching the final in 2014, and here's some photo evidence of that, and feeling my heart drop as I watched the odds after Molly performed, and when I heard how weak the live vocal was. This was the first time I had had genuine hope for our entry since 2011, and I watched it disintegrate before my eyes. That said, the little bit of ambition, the little bit of thinking outside the box that we had shown in 2014 gave me a little bit more hope for 20. 2015. As the dust settled, I was genuinely excited to see how we would build on it for the next year. Did we arrive in Vienna with a great package, a solid artist, and a song that could win it all? Oh God, no. Yes. This might be the ultimate low point. I seriously do not think it could ever possibly get any worse than this. Even though we've had worse results since Electro Velvet, this was a absolute horrific disaster that can never be repeated. First things first, Electro Swing is down there with children singing as the worst and most annoying genre of music on the planet. It is a crime against music and should be banned on penalty of death. Secondly, about the two singers who performed this song, they seem like lovely people and for that reason I can only apologise for what I'm about to say. They were total charisma vacuums. They had absolutely no stage presence and made sure to kill whatever tiny chance we had left of getting some kind of decent result out of this. As for the fever dream of the song itself, whether it's the ridiculous fake English accent, oh yes, oh yes, or the ridiculous lyrics, it's impossible to take it seriously. Don't get me started on the scat verse. This is, of course, what happens if you take a failed talent show participant and a Rolling Stones impersonator and jam them together to make some kind of horrible Frankenstein. They gave them the single greatest musical atrocity that has ever been produced produced, and then threw them on stage in front of 180 million people. To be honest, this could be considered cruel and unusual punishment under the Geneva Convention, both for the artists who had to do it and for the audience who had to watch it. I genuinely think that you can see the scars of this entry on the UK at Eurovision for years afterwards, because after taking a completely ridiculous and unnecessary risk, we proceeded to not take any at all for years and years. That started in 2016, where we actually got our first national final since since 2010. This one actually had multiple songs instead of multiple singers singing the same thing. Unfortunately, this was kind of like choosing your favorite flavor of cardboard. The British public this year decided that their favorite flavor was these two guys, Joe and Jake, with their song, You're Not Alone. You're Not Alone is a bog-standard, middle-of-the-road pop song, but I will admit I have a bit of a soft spot for it. Don't get me wrong, it has very little musical merit, but it just kind of scratches my brain in the right way. And to be honest, I kind of found myself rooting for them because they genuinely seem like really nice guys. Sadly, it was always destined to do badly at Eurovision, and 24th was just about what we deserved. This is the sort of song that Germany would consider fresh and perfect for Eurovision in 2024. To be clear, I mean that in a derogatory fashion. That's about the greatest condemnation I can deliver for its suitability for for the contest. But hey, at least we got 12 points from Malta. Emboldened by this stunning 24th place, we kept the exact same formula in 2017. And this year it did kind of work. We ended up with Never Give Up On You by Lucy Jones. <laughs>
I'm going to front up and say I'll defend this entry to the moon and back because I think Lucy is a fantastic singer. And though the song isn't that great, I thought we made the best of it we could. Lucy has a background in musical theatre and has been very successful in this respect since Eurovision. So she was better suited to the Eurovision stage than many of her predecessors. We got the staging right for this as well. And though I don't really know what she's doing with her hands or why she's making those weird facial expressions, we should be really proud of 111 points and a 15th place finish. Once again, this managed to land us with a little bit of false hope for the future. Luckily, the BBC made sure to quickly dash that with another terrible national final in 2018, once again condemning us to choose our favourite flavour of cardboard. Just like 2016, we got an extremely middle of the road song in the form of Storm by Suri. Storms don't last. To be honest, I did not care one bit for this song. I thought it was dull, I thought it was uninteresting, and I thought that, like many of the entries before it, it was a waste of a clearly extremely talented vocalist. I did not have any time for it whatsoever until during the live show, this happened. Stars. In an instant, I was transformed from the number one biggest naysayer about this song to the biggest Surrey defender in the world. Yes, the song may be terrible, but it's our terrible song. And how dare you try to take our moment of disaster away from us. Ultimately, I think the stage invasion was probably what got this off the bottom of the scoreboard. So in some ways we should be thankful for it. But in any case, Suri limped home to a 24th place finish. While I have massive respect to her for carrying on after that stage invasion, we shouldn't let that distract from the fact that this was an absolute nothing burger of the song and it had no prospect of ever finishing high up in the standings. Luckily, the geniuses over at the BBC decided they knew how to fix it by going back to the oh so successful 2010 system and having one song for multiple singers to try and sing. What we ended up with after that was Michael Rice with the song Bigger Than Us. This went about as well as you would expect by simply not bothering to stage the song, which was totally middle of the road and desperately needed elevation, we came 26th and that's exactly where we deserve to be. I have actually grown to quite resent this result because Michael Rice is clearly a very talented singer once again and once again was simply not given the tools to thrive and succeed. It was a terrible waste of somebody who has a fantastic voice. Little did I know that come 2021, I would long for the heights that 2019 had brought as we achieved something that was meant to be impossible under the new voting system. James Newman with his song Embers was our entry that year. Light up the road. All of us know what happened next. So let's just get over it and remind ourselves how it went down. Zero points. The double zero was traumatic, as well as the polystyrene trumpets on the staging, the terrible song, and the charisma-free performance. But in many ways, it was a needed jolt. James Newman might have taken this result like a champ, but it was the wake-up call that we needed to reevaluate how we were approaching the contest. The reason I've taken you through that tour of nightmares is I do want us to remember how bad things were before 2022, and also remember that, in fairness to the BBC, they have made a massive effort to try and improve our fortune since then. They have dramatically revamped the way they select the entry and they're clearly thinking about it in a much different, much more ambitious way than they were before. Let's talk a bit about 2022 and given how terrible the results were before that, you can imagine how amazing this felt. That second place felt like a win and I can remember literally dancing through the streets of Turin after the show. That year we got everything right from an artist with bags of charisma to a stage show that worked brilliantly on camera and emphasized all of his best qualities. And a song that, while not hugely adventurous, had way more about it than the efforts that came before it. And it felt way more authentic as well. We finally hit on something that is so important in Eurovision, and that is an entry that feels authentic to the country that it's come from. In 2022, by invoking the likes of Elton John with this song, we did that to perfection. I will never forget how I felt the first time I saw the rehearsal footage for this song. The disbelief of seeing a British Eurovision entry, a 
British Eurovision entry that was this good is difficult to describe. How we did it was by actually getting the experts in to help. And in this case, this meant enlisting the services of Tap Music, who were a management company who have worked with the likes of Dua Lipa in the past. It wasn't just the success of the entry itself in the contest, though, that made this such an inflection point. Sam Ryder has gone on to become a household name in the UK. His debut album, which followed up from the contest, went straight to number one in the charts. Later that year, he was even one of the main attractions at the Queen's Platinum Jubilee celebrations. I've argued on this channel in the past that one of the key factors in deciding what kind of result you get in Eurovision and what kind of artists you can attract to represent you, all of this depends on how much buy-in you have from the music industry in the country in question. The important people in those industries, the marketing companies, the management, the labels, and of course the artists themselves have to see the contest as a viable way to progress their own careers. The risk that Tap Music and Sam Ryder took in 2022, or rather the very smart business decision that they took by identifying the contest as a good route to advance his career totally changed the equation on this in the UK. Sadly, things since then haven't quite lived up to expectations. I think there's a few reasons for that, but I don't think we should completely throw the baby out with the bathwater here. I do think though that there are some things that clearly need to change. To quickly review those last two years again, firstly, May Muller, I think this one is fairly simple. Instead, I will May Muller could not sing that song live. I still hear this big note in my nightmares. To be fair to May, she has admitted she wasn't at her best, she was nervous, she was anxious, and I think that's totally understandable given how big of a stage it is. We see artists talk about this every single year, often very experienced performers, get to the Eurovision stage and suddenly find they are not singing to their best. At the same time as well, I Wrote a Song was still really commercially successful in the UK. It was a top 10 hit and I would say that most people probably know it. As a result, I feel like we can let May Muller off with this one and the public mood around Eurovision didn't really shift that much. There was a genuine feeling, I think, in the UK after the 2023 contest that we had done badly simply because the vocal performance was not good enough and that meant that the positivity and the optimism from 2022 lasted until 2024. Then it actually came to this year's contest. And yes, I know, we got null points in the televote again. Yes, the result was a lot less than people hoped for as well. But to be honest, it was kind of coming. The song had no commercial impact either on release or in the week of the contest, either in the UK or across Europe. This was especially disappointing given that Oli Alexander is a household name in this country who has more than a billion streams to his name as part of years and years. With the burden of expectations weighing him down, basically any result was going to be a disappointment unless it was right near the top of the scoreboard. With that in mind though, even though things didn't work out this year, I do think there are some positives to take and plenty of reason not to panic yet. Firstly, while it was perhaps a little confusing in some ways, the way that this was staged, and we probably shouldn't have gone for the Saw movie bathroom kind of vibe, I thought the underlying thought process behind the staging was pretty good. It was creative, it was unusual, it was something that hadn't really been seen in Eurovision before. You need to take those kinds of risks in order to occasionally get something that really works. There were a lot of interesting concepts that were pretty cleverly executed, and while it didn't work out as a whole package, this time, I don't think it should discourage us. It's really important that we stay bold in this respect and continue to push the envelope out with the way we stage songs. We've seen this in junior Eurovision as well, where we took advantage of augmented reality to really great effect. In addition, it is clear that the attitude changes that came in in 2022 are still holding strong. Even though the result didn't go to plan, this was a seriously ambitious participation. This was meant to be Oli Alexander's launch pad as a solo artist with the backing of a major label and with serious money behind it as well. It was clear from the stage show to the music video to how this song was promoted that they were really throwing everything at this. Unfortunately for Oli and the team behind him, they need to look to themselves as to why this didn't work out. Dizzy was never going to be a song that would suit 
Eurovision. It was clear from the moment it released that it was not going to compete at the top end of the scoreboards. Any argument otherwise was delusion, and I will include myself in that blind hope. Hopefully, others in the industry will see this for how it was as well, and not quickly jump to any conclusions. It's not the contest that was the architect of Ollie Alexander's demise this year, but rather the performance and the song itself. In this case, those fell well short of expectations. Zero points, of course, is extremely harsh, and I would argue undeserved, but in a year where eight countries receive points from basic everyone else, you're always going to be fighting for scraps, and that means that some people will simply lose out. To be honest, despite this result, Oli has landed on his feet anyway. He's been a regular on the festival circuit this summer, and it's clear that his career has not taken as big a hit as people may have feared. With all of that in mind, we do still need to change the approach a little bit for next year, and we don't have another Oli Alexander style figure waiting in the wings to repeat the tricks of 2024. We also don't have the partnership with Tap Music anymore, which was only ever meant to be a one-year arrangement extended to two only because we were hosting the contest. Based on the budgetary constraints and the lack of enthusiasm for the idea in the BBC at the moment, I think we can rule out, at least in the next couple of years, the chances of there being a British national final again. To be honest, at the moment, I just don't think there's the money to make this kind of show a reality in the way that would make it an effective way of selecting the entry. With that in mind, though, in the medium term and long term, I would like to see a national final, and I think we can look to UMK in Finland to see how we could do this well. Yes, I know. I'm banging on about Finland again, but there's actually a serious point to this, so bear with me. The reason why I'm comparing to something like UMK rather than something like Melody Festivalen is that part of why Melody Festivalen can be so big is the use of sponsorship. The BBC can't do that and it's the same for Ulla in Finland. This means that the BBC has to fund the show in the same way that Ulla does, so they can learn a lot of lessons from them as a result. Ulla have also successfully embedded themselves in the music industry in Finland to the point where some of Finland's biggest artists want to participate in the show and want to go to Eurovision. They've put together a top tier show and while it's a long-term project, I would really love to see the BBC replicate this in the next three to five years. That would be much better than rushing something into place for 2025 before the concept is fully ready to go. That leaves us with internal selection. And for this, I have one simple request. Can we please please just be a little bit more adventurous. Don't get me wrong, Sam Ryder is a national hero, and even though the results weren't great, May Muller and Ollie Alexander were still miles above some of the utter crap we had in the 2010s. The one big criticism I have here is that it feels like we're operating in this really narrow lane of pop when the British music scene has so much more to offer than this. What do I have to do to get the BBC to send something that isn't radio-friendly pop? When was the last time that we had an entry that drew on the influences that artists like Sam Fender and Charlie XCX and Stormzy and Dave and others draw on. I don't often start waving the British flag around like this, but I rarely get more patriotic than when I think about the incredible and vibrant music scene that we have in this country. Musical diversity gets rewarded at Eurovision and it's time we took advantage of that because basically nobody is as well placed to do that as we are. I find it so frustrating that we have all of this untapped potential in synth pop and grime and indie rock and so many other areas. We're simply not taking advantage of it right now. The way to get these artists into Eurovision is by meeting them where they're at. To take Finland as an example again, one big change they made was by engaging with Ule X, the music radio station station geared towards younger listeners because they had the links in the music industry much as BBC Radio 1 already does in the UK they were then able to build on those connections and get a much much stronger set of artists into the competition BBC Radio 1 as I said is universally respected in this country and it's madness to not leverage those relationships to the maximum possible extent. While our attitude is still better behind the scenes, it's vital that we take advantage of the strength of our music industry and use it in 2025, because the afterglow of Liverpool 2023 is not going to last forever. We do still have time, but it has to happen soon. With our withdrawal from Junior Eurovision just this week, in spite of improved viewing figures this year, we are at risk once again of the BBC losing interest in Eurovision and losing interest in reaching to the higher end of the score. Board. I really don't think I can face another decade like the 2010s in Eurovision for the UK, so I am begging the BBC to please, please not put us through that again. One small footnote as well while I'm at it, we do need to make sure that the singers we choose can actually sing live. I really don't want there to be a repeat of the May Muller situation again because that was awkward for everyone. Alternatively, we could just do what we should have done in 2023, which is slap the contract 
on the table in front of Rina Sawayama and let her write whatever numbers she wants on it. Put it on the table. <laughs> yeah. Let him sign it. Let him write whatever numbers he wants to put on there, given what he's done now since he's come in. And let him sign the contract and go. Rina. Let the will, man. He's doing it. He's doing his thing. Seriously, I would sell a kidney to make this happen. In all seriousness, the BBC still has the opportunity to get creative, do something a bit different, and show the best of British music at Eurovision in the years to come. If we can do that to even moderate success, next year we can start to build the institutional support within the industry we need to make that success more sustainable. It will involve taking some risks, but we need to do it and the potential payoff could be massive. Over the next six months, I am planning to build up my hopes to a ridiculously high standard to be inevitably disappointed by whatever it is we end up producing next year. In the meantime, there are going to be plenty of other things for me to yap about on this channel as well. Chief among those will be the Eurovision 2024 Iceberg Explained videos, which are coming soon. I promise they will be on the channel in July and August and they will be worth the wait. I have some seriously cool surprises for those videos and I'm really looking forward to sharing them with you. In the meantime, thank you as always for watching. Sorry for the gap between last video and this video. It was a combination of being totally burned out and real life catching up with me a little bit, but we are back on the horse now and there will be another video in two weeks time as well. In the meantime, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for all of your ongoing support and I will see you soon.